You know, I love that intro so much. I have half a mind to do it again, but we're not going to because it said we're on the laid back bike report. That's all I said. Uh, and I think you probably missed that. But welcome, everybody. We're glad you're all with us today on the laid back bike report. Let me tell you what we got coming up on today's webcast. We have uh, the new bench shop owner, Joe Leon from uh, San Antonio, Texas. We're going to talk about his new shop. We've got Chuck Coyne with us today. Yeah, he is the uh, recumbent CycleCon dude, and he's going to tell us all about what uh, exciting new stuff is going to be seen this year at CycleCon and, uh, and a new venue, I think, as well. So we'll look forward to talking to Chuck in a few minutes. We have Jason Miller, and uh, Jason has a YouTube channel and, among other things, uh, talks about Tannis tires. Uh, and we'll talk more about that and a couple of other things that he does. We have CJ Hoyle. Uh, another YouTuber uh, makes great instructional videos about um, his builds with uh, his bikes and also does a lot of touring uh, and uh, makes videos about that, uh, does great videos. So we'll be talking to CJ, uh, another interesting guy. So uh, we look forward to, to doing that. Now, how about we talk to uh, my crew, the guys who make this, uh, this whole enterprise possible. First of all, from uh, from New York State, uh, Alfred Station, I believe, is where he is. We were just there, actually, a week and a half or so ago. It's Peter Stahl, the bicycle man. Peter, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> Peter's working hard at trying to make everything work there at the bicycle shop. Yep, he's doing good. Great to have you with us, Peter. Let's move on to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today, he's doing our directing and uh, been working hard learning the ropes of this new system. It's Larry Seidman. Bring yourself on there, Larry. Hey. Hello, everybody. Hey, Larry. It's good to have you on, Larry. All right. Next, our media wrangler, as I call him. He's down in Jackson, Mississippi. It's Trey Burgoyne. Hey, Trey. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. All righty, good to have you. And let's go to Sarah, Pennsylvania, where recently back from, uh, I don't know, what do you say, 6,000 miles of traveling, uh, doing the uh, RAM and uh, crewing for the RAM, and I think officiating. It's Denny Voorhees, our sports director. Denny? Yeah, 8,432 miles, actually. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I sandbagged you a little, didn't I? Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And uh, good to have you, Denny. And lastly, uh, back this month, we're glad to have him. It's Brian Ball, the news director and uh, Bent Rider Online uh, uh, co. Hey. Uh, co. Uh, what are you? Co. Something. You're co. Something. something. Co. Something. Co. Conspirator. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> He's our news director. Co conspirator. Sorry, I missed last month. Yeah, we're great. We're, it's great to have you back, uh, Brian. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> so. Um, Really, if at this point, if uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we do here and how you can help us out. So first of all, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. I know most of you probably have, but if you're a new viewer or you haven't got around to it, it really helps us out, get those numbers up. Uh, really, uh, YouTube uh, gives us a little bit more to work with, uh, with more subscribers. So uh, you'll see a little, uh, a little uh, laid back back report logo right down there. Click on it, it'll take you to the YouTube channel and you can uh, uh, subscribe and click the little notification bell and you get a notification when, uh, whenever we go live or post a new video, that would help us out. And in the upper right hand corner, you're gonna see a little letter I pop up for information. So you wanna find out more about the laid back back report, it'll take you to our website. And uh, you'll find out all the information you need, past shows, uh, what's coming up, and a bunch of stuff. And we'll talk about what's on the website as we uh, close out here today, give you more details about that. And lastly, uh, the live chat. So we've got it rolling here already today. It is so much a part of what we do now to make uh, the live show uh, interactive. And we've got people from all over the world. Uh, let me see real quickly here. Let me say hi to just a few people that we got. Ramblin' Ran Ramblin Randy 65. Hello, uh, Robert Tengler. Good to see you. Bob Pelton. Uh, Derek Pyrie. Uh, he's in South Africa. Uh, George Mills, my buddy around the corner here. Hello, George. Smart Bikes TV. They're in Germany. We met them uh, at Spetsy a little bit early. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Uh, Bruno Francois, it's good to see you from the French Riviera. Not a bad place to be. And uh, OK, that's enough for right now. But uh, yeah, so the live chat, if you are on YouTube, uh, you can just uh, look over to that side and hop right on it on the uh, web. 
uh, or if you're on mobile, uh, look down, scroll up a little bit and you'll see the live chat down there. So feel free to participate, say hi, uh, tell us where you're from. If you have questions or comments as we go through the show, that's the place to put them. We'll keep our eyes open for them. I'll put your comments and questions up on the screen when our guests pop up. Uh, it's a good time. So um, we hope to see you guys there. All right. Today's show is sponsored by TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And Trailside.bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida. And Cruise Bike. Destined and designed for the cyclist who wants to ride farther, climb faster, and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And Lightning Cycles, the aerospace designed and race across America record owning recumbent that you've always wanted. Okay, folks, and uh, we're going to get the show rolling right now with our news director. We introduced a couple minutes ago. It's Brian Ball. Brian, come on. Bring you on up here. There we go. Hey, how's it going? And uh, it's going great. So let's uh, let's go ahead with that news report, and uh, we'll stand by and listen. Okay. Uh, the news report is kind of that there isn't that much news. It's summertime. It is tis the season, as they say. Everybody's just building bikes. Not a whole lot of new stuff coming out. That usually comes kind of in the fall. But I did want to point out, if you guys do want to keep up on news on uh, recumbents, most of these uh, companies have pretty good newsletters and stuff now, especially some of the big ones. I'm just going to point out three here that I think are really cool that I enjoy reading that you should probably check out. So I'll bring up the first slide. I don't know what order these are in. So, uh, yeah, the AZUB one is, is probably my favorite. They do a lot of cool stuff, the AZUB newsletter. Again, all these you can just sign up on their websites. Uh, they report on, as this one is, it was, uh, you know, combined age of 129 years old, and they're out traveling the world. It's a really cool little article. They do a great job. Just shows what people are doing with their bikes and trikes. It's pretty neat. The AZUB one is one that's kind of more, uh, it, it does a lot more just uh, showing what people are doing with their bikes. But they also do introduce new stuff there, uh, often before they even tell guys like Gary and I. So uh, check that one out. Next up. Catrike. Uh, Catrike is a Catrike connection, they call it. They don't call it a newsletter, but it's basically what it is. Uh, they do a lot of profiles of local dealers, which I think is, is pretty great. So if you are if you subscribe to it and you're like, oh, hey, a dealer popped up 100 miles from me, I can go check them out. Uh, pretty neat stuff. They also do uh, profiles. with uh, Catrike does a whole lot of stuff with uh, disabled veterans and things like that. You'll see a lot of uh, very uh, inspirational little articles about that, too. So check that one out if you're a Catrike fan. And lastly, Cruise Bike uh, does a lot of what the other two that I, I mentioned, uh, they do a lot of travel profiles, a lot of articles about their, their customers and things like that. But also, Cruise Bike does a cool thing. A lot of times you get early access. If you are signed up uh, to their newsletter, you might get an early access to a new model or sometimes even exclusive colors and stuff like that. Uh, so if, if you're a real Cruise Bike fan and you kind of want the newest, coolest one, uh, definitely sign up for the cruise bike newsletter. It's uh, it's always a great read, even if you're not super into cruise bikes. That, that qualifies for all three of these. If you're not super into that brand, it's just it's just cool content to read. They always have really good articles. They're always very well written, and uh, all three of them. So those are my top three to go check out during this time of the summer when we're all riding, and uh, you know we get done with the ride, you want to sit and read something cool. Go check those three out. There's other good ones too, but those are just three that came to my mind to put up here today. Hey, Brian, uh, speaking of cruise bike, um, I don't remember all the details, but they had posted uh, that they were going to support their uh, riders uh, if they ran in various um, competitions, like in terms of helping out with the uh, entrance fees uh, and that sort of thing. Did you see that? Yeah, um, I did see that. I was in one of those one of those emails. That I okay, just I thought maybe yeah, that yeah. it was. Yeah, they, yeah they're, they're going to start doing kind of a, I would call it a mini sponsorship sort of program micro sponsorship i don't know what the cool kids use for those kind of terms now but yeah it's kind of a unique idea and i yeah, think it is, just yeah. help people out and, and and you know they are big like we are uh uh in in encouraging folks to uh to ride uh and and compete more you know Denny's yeah. always big about uh, doing the uh doing the rides and stuff and we like to encourage and that they always too, have so. been since the day they existed so mm -hmm. that's that's really kind of unsurprising that they're doing that but yeah it is all right brian well i know you got a bunch of personal stuff to take care of thanks a lot uh, for coming on it's great to have you back thanks for having uh, me on 
Yep, sure. We take care and we'll see you later on. Folks, we are going to move along to our next guest. Uh, our friend Bill McBride uh, sent me a tip about a brand new recumbent shop opening up in San Antonio, Texas. So uh, at this point, let's head on down to Texas and meet jo Joe Leon, uh, the owner of Pedal Guerrero. Hello, Joe. How are you doing, Gary? I am doing great. So uh, Joe, uh, Joe and I met just uh, really this past week. Uh, I contacted him. He was very anxious to come on and share uh, what he knows about uh, his new shop and the background. So Joe, let's start out there. Can you tell us about uh, the background? How did you, uh, how was th this whole idea conceived and, uh, and, what, and how did you put it all together? I was um, a triathlete. I used to race uh, sprint triathlons in my back through the military just got uh, worse and worse and I could not race whatsoever. Uh, got really depressed, um, was kind of overweight and the VA had a adaptive cycling clinic for me. I never knew these things existed. I didn't know what a recumbent was, didn't know what a trike was um, and it changed my world for me. Uh, started riding uh, competitively, uh, racing trikes uh, with the other disabled veterans. And I got tired of taking my bike to places that didn't know what this was. I kind of look at it like a three-headed monster. Like, what is this thing? What do you want me to do with it? Um, the nearest shop was uh, 40, 50 miles away in good traffic. It would take an hour or so. So I decided to open up my own shop here in San Antonio and, and serve the disabled, um, make this, this technology, this, this tool to get out and move around. Yeah, I couldn't think of a, a better concept for the thing. Now, let's go ahead and go to that first slide and let's take a look at your shop. So when uh, when did you actually open up? This is uh, my fourth week of opening. Um, it, it's been a great opening. I had uh, some help designing the name. It actually means Pedal Warrior in Spanish since this is South Texas. Um, Guerrero is, is Spanish for warrior. Uh, since I, a lot of my friends are, are veterans, so I thought that was kind of fitting. It makes sense. All right, let's take a look at your shop. So there's the outside. Go ahead and tell us uh, tell us about how it went as uh, the opening and and how your first uh, few weeks have been as we go through the pictures. The opening has been uh, really great. Uh, we had uh, probably about seventy five people flow through the store at uh, the local media, a couple news channels. Uh, the local state senator was down there. Um, I carry 10 different uh, brands. I think it's very important, uh, like anything, like a pair of shoes, you need to try everything to make sure what fits you best. Um, we are a full service shop. I am uh, gone to Portland to get certified at UBI. I'm a certified um, bike mechanic and wheel builder. Okay. And there you have a nice shot of some of the things you carry along with uh couple trikes there on the stand. It looks beautiful, Joe. That's really, who designed the, the, the inside of the building there? It was a firm here in San Antonio called Luna Creative uh, helped, it, helped me design it and come up with my logo. I think yeah. they did an amazing job. It's nice to have that two layer look there for, for showing a lot of different trikes. Uh, it reminds me of Trident trikes uh, when I'm over there, uh, over there and they have a, like a two layer level thing too to show off. A great, it's a good way of showing off a lot of trikes in a relatively it's a good use of space. space. Yeah, yeah. I can get all my trikes out there uh, so everyone can see and kind of pick and choose. And then we go out back and we can ride whatever we want to ride. So you have a nice area for doing test rides? Yeah, sure. It's about a quarter mile uh, strip out and back uh, so uh, to test ride. And it's got some varying terrain so you can feel the, the road and get a good feel for the trike. Okay. So uh, in closing then, let, give me an idea about your, your plans for the future then. What, what are your hopes for the shop and, and do you have some ideas about expansion? I know it's very early to talk about that, but what, what do you really uh, look at as, as far as goals for your shop? I would just like to see more people out on the trail. San Antonio is pretty growing as far as their, their network of trails. I'd like to see more recumbents on the road. I'd like to see more disabled getting out and enjoying San Antonio and enjoying the recumbent. To me, riding a recumbent is uh, like being a little kid again. It, it energizes me. I love it. Puts that smile on, on your face, doesn't it? So. Yes, sure does. All right, Joe. Well, it's a pleasure having you on. And uh, it's a nice little introduction, I think, to that shop. Pedal Guerrero, folks. So if you're in uh, the, the 
San Antonio area, anywhere, please stop in and, and see see Joe. And uh, we're going to, of course, uh, put uh, the links to uh, his website, uh, and you can make contact with him if you have any questions uh, later on for him. So, uh, Joe, thank you so much for coming on, and we will see you around, buddy. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everybody. Have a All good right. day. You too. Thank you. All right, folks, that was Joe Leon. So let's uh, move on now to uh, uh, a guy who has been on the Laid Back Bike Report a few times uh, and instrumental in actually helping us get started quite a few years ago. Uh, it's a good friend. It's Chuck Coyne. Chuck, come on. Let's see you. Pop in there. Can we get him? There you go. Oh, yeah. There's that two shot. This is weird, but uh, all right. So uh, thanks for coming on, Chuck. How you doing? Doing well, Gary. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, you're you're always welcome on this show, of course. So uh, we've got another uh, big event coming up in October, and uh, I know you've got all the lowdown on it. So why don't you go ahead and tell us about what we got? We got some slides to show in the meantime, and okay, uh, great. let's talk about it. What you got going, Chuck? Well, thank thank you for this opportunity, Gary. First, uh, I want to say uh, uh, congratulations to the USA women's soccer team for winning the uh, FIFA World Cup today. That was very exciting and uh, a great show put on by those uh, amazing female athletes. So the uh, 2019 uh, Recumbent Cycle Con will be October 11, 12, 13 at the Fairgrounds Nashville. Um, Friday, October 11 is our, our dealer and industry only day. And that's the day that we set aside for dealers from around the country and the world. We've had uh, dealers come from Europe and Canada and Israel and uh, South America. So uh, that's the day that uh, the dealers will have uh, exclusive uh, uh, access to the bicycles on display and the, and the outdoor demo riding arena. And then on Saturday, we open it up to uh, the general public as well as on Sunday. Um, Friday evening, uh, we have our, our industry uh, reception and we'll announce the uh, 2019 uh, uh, recumbent industry uh, individual. Um, and uh, that's always a, a great opportunity for the industry members. Uh, Saturday, the uh, uh, consumer hours are from nine until five. Uh, all the booths will be open to all the uh, uh, consumer attendees. Uh, they will have the same access to uh, the bikes on display and the bikes to be ridden on the outdoor demo riding arena. Um, we have a brand new building that will be in this year at the uh, fairgrounds at Nashville. They're undergoing a, a complete rebuild of the of the fairgrounds. Uh, when they're finished, they'll have a major league uh, soccer um, stadium and so uh, the the building that we will be in is will be brand new they will have had a few events in it prior to our going in but uh, it's a much larger building uh, brand new restaurant and everything going in with it and uh, the outdoor demo riding area will be uh, brand new uh, asphalt and concrete so it will be uh, much smoother than we had last year um, we have uh, you know the the admission uh, should mention that um, on Saturday, admission is $10, and that's uh, per person, uh, and that's good again from 9 till 5. Uh, Sunday admission is free. Sunday hours are from 10 till 3. Um, we have uh, some major industry announcements that will be being made at, at the show this year. I can't really divulge what they are now, but there's, there's some big, uh, big changes coming in. Um, I think the biggest uh, uh, theme this year is going to be e-assist. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if uh, just every uh, exhibiting recumbent manufacturer and trike manufacturer uh, doesn't have uh, some kind of electric assist. Um, you know, in that uh, tune, um, we're hoping to have a, a Bosch um, mechanic, uh, bicycle mechanic uh, certification uh, seminar on Friday for uh, Terratrike dealers. Uh, Terratrike has just switched over recently to uh, using Bosch um, uh, electric systems for their for their uh, bikes and for their trikes rather, and they will have um, uh, a requirement for any dealer that that uh, will service the Bosch equipped trikes to be Bosch certified. So we're trying to put together a Bosch certification uh, day at at the show. Um, we uh, have been, you know, conducting the show since 2011. We've done the shows in Los Angeles, Chicago, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and this is our second year in Nashville. Uh, 2020, we will have a new location, and that's to be announced later. 
but so far this year, uh, you know, all the all the uh, pretty much uh, industry standouts will be uh, exhibiting with us again, including Avenue Azub Bacetta Carver is a new bike, our new uh, yeah new recumbent bike manufacturer. They make a titanium bike. Uh, Cruise bike will be there. Green Speed Haze, HP Velotechnic, Ice Performer, Rand Sunseeker, Terra Trike, Tri Trikes, Trident. Uh, try it, and we have a couple of other uh, uh, possible new um, uh, entries into the recumbent field, uh, and then we'll also have the accessory folks like ATOC, uh, Bendit, uh, Easy Load Ramps, Falco E Assist, TerraCycle, and 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 other uh, that are that we're negotiating with right now too. So, looks to be a, a really good show this year. I'm really excited to uh, uh, see the new facility. I'll be going out there in a few weeks for a, a, a pre-show checkout into. Uh, lay out the uh, the final uh, uh, schematic for the sh floor plan and for the uh, demo writing arena. And um, so, Gary, unless you have any questions, I've probably used up my allotment of free time here. Yeah, I was going to cut you off five minutes ago. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. It was good to have. No, all great stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, the laid back bike report. Bent Rider Online, we're going to be there as you media bet. and covering the whole thing for you. So uh, hopefully be able to, for those of you who can't make it, we will, uh, number one, shoot you the news that Chuck's talking about that he can't divulge yet. We're, we're, we're all as curious as you are as to what that's about. And, uh, and of course, we're going to we're gonna make the video again. We're going to have the great uh, extravaganza uh, recumbent cycle con video. We'll, uh, we'll cover all those people, all those booths, do all the interviews and the test rides and everything. Now, Chuck, um, so this year, one notable difference, of course, is there's not going to be any racing. And there's a good reason for that, you told me. Yeah. Right, right. Part of the reason we can't have racing is, is they're using the track for um, storage and and uh, movement of equipment and such for this this remodeling. Basically what they're doing, anyone that was at the show last year, the building that we were in last year will be leveled and they're put, that's where they're putting the uh, uh, the, uh, the soccer stadium. And and so um, the uh, seminars and, and, the, uh, and the exhibits uh, will all be in this, this brand new building. And maybe we wanna talk about the seminars a little bit because uh, they're important. On Friday, we have uh, seminars uh, uh, aimed at uh, dealers and their and their staff, and then Saturday and Sunday uh, we have seminars uh, that are also you know free to attend um, with your admission to the show, uh, covering all kinds of aspects: uh, uh, electrical assist, uh, retrofitting electrical assist, uh, travel, uh, touring on on bikes and trikes, and and. Uh, uh, yeah, I think maybe what we, I think I think you have Sylvie. You been Gary? You've been yeah, talking so about Sylvie, exactly. Maybe, maybe talk about that a little bit because sure, I'm kind of excited got, about her being there. We are. We're real excited uh, now. Sylvia Halpern. Uh, most of you guys know she's no stranger to the Layback Bike Report. We've had uh, we've had uh, contact with her in a number of places where she's traveled around the world on her trike, and she is going to be coming and spending the weekend at our booth at Recumbent Cycle Con. And uh, Chuck has been kind enough to offer her uh, a slot, uh, I think, on Saturday uh, at the seminars. Uh, so come and see and talk to Sylvia Halpern. Of course, she'll be happy to talk uh, with you and talk, tell you about her touring and uh, watch her seminar. Uh, I was also going to say, Chuck, that uh, we're going to send people to the website, of course, because you can't mention everything that's going on at the show, including the long list, as we are starting to see, of, of seminar uh, speakers. And you'll find that also at the uh, at the uh, Recumbent CycleCon uh, website, which we will have uh, listed in the uh, description below. Uh, and after the thing, www.recumbentcyclecon.com. Right, we'll have that down there, so you guys can click on it and uh, head back to it a couple of times between now and October because things uh, are going to be updated and changing, I'm sure. So yeah, there, there's also travel information. We have uh, discount rooms available uh, at the headquarters hotel, and all that information is is on the website. Very good. Chuck Coyne, we are so glad that you uh, took the time to come and share that information with uh, our viewers today on the Layback Back Report. Chuck, we will uh, talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thank you, Gary, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in October. We can't wait. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Thank All you. right. Chuck Coyne, folks. All right. Now we are going to go to our first major segment of the day, um, our featured first featured guest. Uh, he lives in Clifton, New Jersey. He rides a cat trike Dumont and he's working towards an epic tour 
and it has been a great YouTube channel. Uh, he has a great YouTube channel that's full of bent related news and rides. So for, we're happy to welcome the youngest old turtle that I've ever seen to the laid back bike report. It's Jason Miller. Hello, Jason. Hello. Jason, we're really glad that you are, are here. I know you had a little travel uh, difficulties uh, mm -hmm. over the last uh, 24, 48 hours, uh, but you made yeah. it, so we're glad. Yeah, I'm lucky to be here, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, let's let's uh, let's start out with a couple of questions, and then we're going to go to the slideshow, and you can tell us a little bit more about specifically about some of the things that you've done. Sounds so uh, my first question, and it's a typical one, I want to know how you got into recumbent trikes. What's the story? Oh well, uh, I started off on a uh, recumbent bike. I have a uh, I have a Burley Django, and I absolutely love it. Um, but the problem is, a lot of the hills around here are just a well. I was going to say a bit too steep, but way too steep for me to get up without having to get off and walk it, or you know, fall. And um, I had started vlogging uh, because uh, I, I am autistic, and I'm trying to be more social. I have uh, Asperger's. And um, there's another vlogger out there named Darren Alf, BicycleTouringPro.com, that I started watching, and that kind of got me into vlogging. So I started vlogging with a recumbent and joining the recumbent groups on Facebook. And then I found um, uh, Jio, uh, Matt Gallett, and his trike. And I thought that was just absolutely awesome. You know, I watched him climbing hills. He was going really slow, but he was doing it. He wasn't having to get up. He could stop and then restart. And that's when I decided. You know, I think that's probably uh, better for me. So I uh, started looking for a trike. All right. There's Paula Havens saying she loves the, the, this show and apparently is a fan of yours as well. So oh, thank there you. There we go. That was on chat. All right. So uh, tell me uh, on your uh, on the uh, YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a little logo there. It says Old Turtle. And you also yeah. call yourself the IHOP Poet. I was intrigued. So tell me about those two names. Where do they come from? Well, the IHOP poet is much older, and it actually used to be the Pancake House poet, um, but it doesn't really flow well as far as internet names go. Um, I was much younger, much stupider, and me and some of my friends, we were, uh, well, we, we, we got stoned. And it was the middle of the night, and of course, what comes with being stoned is uh, getting the munchies. So uh, we... Uh, we were stoned, we were a little drunk, and we made our way to the Pancake House. And one of my friends dared me uh, to climb up on the table and start reciting some of my poems. So, you know, me being a uh, young, stupid, drunk, stoned, and even when I wasn't drunk or stoned, I, I have very few inhibitions. I don't get embarrassed. I think that comes with the autism. Uh, so I did it, and I climbed up on the table and recited a couple of my poems, got a standing ovation from the few truckers and golf kids that were all in the, the pancake house with us. Yeah. Uh, we were asked to leave, of course, but they didn't make us pay for our food. So my friend started calling me the pancake house poet and it kind of stuck. And that evolved to, uh, to, um, I hot poet. And who doesn't love free pancakes? I mean, <laughs> when it, when it comes down to it. All right. And then, so from that young foolish, uh, I hot poet, you became the old turtle. What's, what's that story? Uh, I went to China with my wife and we uh, did the, uh, the great wall. So we hiked the great wall and, uh, we started hiking and people were passing us cause you know, I'm disabled. So I was kind of going slow and you know, they would, they would pass us and they would kind of laugh at me a little bit. And a few of them would make it a couple towers up and they would yell back, Hey American, are you okay? And I would wave back at them. I'm okay. Anyway, so we kept going and, and eventually we get to the point where we're the only ones on the trail. We're looking around. It's not a trail. We're the only ones on the wall and we're looking around. There's no one there, but we keep going. And uh, most of the people, they got off on Tower 3 or Tower 4 where they have the uh, the toboggan ride or the uh, cable car ride down. Uh, we kept going. We did a total of 14 towers. And um, when we got back, you know, we got off and then we had to walk back to the uh, to the uh, entrance area where they have all the restaurants and shops and they were there and they were laughing at me because it took so long. And um, when they found out how far we actually went, they were shocked. And I, I guess I left out an important part. I, every time they would laugh at me for going slow, I would just keep saying slow and steady, you know, slow and steady wins the race. And a couple of them got the reference, but they, they still laughed at me. 
but they were actually amazed at how far we went. So they called, started calling me the old turtle, um, La Ugue. And uh, so I have that printed. That's my logo. And I have it printed on my shirt. And um, my wife is Chinese and her in-laws or her, her parents, my in-laws now live with us. And we moved them here. And uh, when my mother-in-law first saw the shirt, she was shocked because apparently Lao Wei old turtle in China for the older gen- for the older generation, the younger wow. generation doesn't know anything about it. But the old generation, if you called someone a old, old turtle, that is a man whose wife cheated on him, but he was too much of a coward to do anything about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a loaded. It's a loaded phrase, obviously. Well, yes. tell me about. Uh, so who who drew up the uh, who drew up that the logo? Uh, me and my wife. It's beautiful. It really, it's a great job. So you, and I've seen some of the, uh, some of the uh, graphics that you do on the YouTubes and they're wonderful. So I, I'm guessing you do that too. So you're pretty talented. Thank you. All right. Let's move along it's now. Mainly my oh, wife, but some is of it, it's me. Let's see. And you're, you're also humble. So that's good. <laughs> let's move along to the YouTube channel if we can. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about those leggings. I did, I did see that video, but let's, uh, let's move on. Well, you know what, if you want, I want to talk about the two major themes Okay. Uh, that we want, but I know you've got a little bit more. So this was your, one of your latest videos. Uh, you, want, you want to talk about it briefly as we go through the slide? This was the uh, the mermaid parade on at Cody Island, Coney Island, and the leggings were given to me uh, by a member of the New York City uh, Recumbent Club, and uh, because it was pretty bright and sunny out there, and uh, so that kept me from getting sunburned. Uh, probably the most interesting thing about this ride, uh, something I never really thought of before, is as I was riding through. Three or four different people stopped me and they said, thank you for your service. And the first time it kind of shocked me, I was like, you know, was it the leggings? Was it the hat? What about me? Because I was never in the military. And I explained it to them. But um, it slow, eventually I realized it's because I'm on the trike and um, there's a group out there called um, Wounded Warriors, uh, which is an amazing group. And they help uh, wounded veterans get trikes. And I guess that's a pretty public thing. People know it. So uh, when they saw when they saw me on the trike, I guess a lot of people assumed I was a veteran, which I'm not. So I corrected I corrected them. And, you know, but I, I thought it was interesting. That happens, though, a lot. I think people kind of assume that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's uh, maybe uh, with this slide, we can talk about your trike because uh, okay. before we get on to those other uh, more uh, mainstream themes, tell us about your trike and we can start with this. Well, it's the Cat Trike Dumont. It's fully suspended. It has a suspension in the rear. Uh, a shock in the rear, and then it has a, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It has a weird proprietary shock system in the front, um, but it works. It works really well. It's, a, it's an extremely comfortable trike to ride. Uh, the main reason I bought it was that not only does it fold up, but the seat folds up and stays on. Every other fold-up trike, uh, you have to actually remove the seat. So when you fold it up and you move it, you now have two pieces. And I have to walk with a cane, which means when I push the which when I push the uh, folded up trike, I have to use one hand. So you know um, that thing up there, uh, the uh, the motor, the red thing, is called the um, oh, what is that called? The Copenhagen wheel. The Copenhagen wheel. Yeah, and it, you're supposed to get like 30 miles on it, Nico. And I am lucky when I do use it continuously to get 15 miles. So that's a battery that I carry with me uh, in case I use it. But when I go on tour, I, I tend to only use it on heels. Uh, but I never know if I'm going to be able to plug it in the night before. So I keep that with me. Okay. So just as an, uh, an aside, I saw a post uh, this past week from uh, one of my Facebook friends. I don't know if this is going on or not. But the, she said something about the, the Copenhagen wheel is on sale, like $400 off. I don't know if it was just over 4th of July or not. But if it's something you're interested in, we've talked about the Copenhagen wheel before, guys. Uh, if you are interested in it, uh, check out their uh, website. Uh, Super Pedestrian, I think, is what it is. Yes, it and is. Uh, I don't know if it's still on sale, but it might be worthwhile if you're seeing this video uh, anytime real soon. It might be worthwhile to check it out. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. Uh so uh, I'm still talking about the trike, I guess. So uh, yeah. well, this this uh, this slide here is of the um, Tannis tire. Yeah. My, so let's introduce that, Tannis I guess. Tires. Yeah. Let's. So one of the one of the really cool uh, videos that uh, Jason did I, that really caught my attention. This is the one that caught my attention was about Tannis tires, and I've seen quite a bit of talk about it online. It's the airless tires, and uh, and and Jason not only evaluated them, I mean, he's had quite a bit of experience now with them and has quite a story. So let, go ahead and tell us, maybe start at the beginning of the Tannis tire story, and we'll go through these. 
Okay. Well, the reason I got them was because of my disabilities, it's very hard for me to change the tires, uh, especially to change the tube, especially the, the rear wheel with, with the uh, motor on it because it's heavy. Um, out on the road, there would be absolutely no way that I'd be able to get it off myself. So I switched over to these because I, I never wanted to have to deal with the flat again. And uh, in that first picture you showed of the, the Tannis tire, um, you've already switched over to another, yeah, that one. Uh, as you can see, that's a Tannis tire and it's flat. Um, it actually came that way. Um, it was a de defect in the tire, but uh, you know, the tire that can never go flat actually arrived flat. I think that's a, there's a little irony there. Um, but um, I rode it around the first night, but it was dark. I didn't realize that. I just thought that there was a lot of rolling resistance to it. And um, the next week I got a chance to ride it in the daylight and I saw that it was flat. Um, this image was on the uh, DNR trail, the, the 80 mile uh, bike trip that my wife and I took. And this was coming back. We were coming up a gravel incline and my wife couldn't get up it. So I backed up. I, I let myself roll down the incline. Uh, turned on the motor to eco and just started pedaling as hard as I could. And when I got up to her, I shoved her and got her up the trail. And just as I was about to uh, hit the peak of the trail, my bike stopped moving. It wouldn't go forward. It wouldn't come backwards. And so I got off it and I realized that, that the tire had actually popped right off. So uh, I was able to get it back on with a, with a flat wrench that I have and uh, get it to a local bike shop. When it came off, it, it bent my derailleur. They were able to fix that. It only cost me 20 bucks in a couple of hours. So it wasn't a big deal, but it was, uh, you know, it was kind of disconcerting. Yeah. That, needless that to say, you've off. not had a smooth introduction to Tam's yeah. tires and uh, with the, with the flat, the bottom of the, of the, of yeah. the initial one. And, and now this one's and, a different wheel. Okay. Okay. So now, but you know what, if you would, uh, that first video that you had, I think described, uh, the installation and, and how, yeah. can you, could you briefly talk about that? Uh, and what, what's, what's it like to put those things on? You, it, they come off by themselves apparently, but what's it like to, <laughs> what's it like to put them on? Uh, it's actually quite difficult. They're very hard to get the pins on. Uh, the first thing you gotta do is feed the pins through or the pegs through, and then you gotta, you gotta get one snapped in and then you just work your way around forcing the tire on and the tires, the tire when it's cold is very hard to stretch after riding it like those went back on pretty easy because i've been riding it they were warm and they stretched easy um but when they're cold and new they're very hard to get in mm -hmm. um the reason the first one popped off is i actually used the wrong peg i mean i i had the largest peg that they gave me but it i guess it wasn't quite large enough because it had room to play i used the red peg um now it has the green peg in it and um, so that's the reason that one popped off. Uh, you got to whack those in like with a, with a little rubber. Yeah, that's what, that's what I used. Uh, <laughs> it was the only way I can get them in. They, they don't recommend that, I guess, because I guess you could damage your, uh, your tire, your wheel if you're not careful. Yeah. They come with this uh, a tool they call the S tool that you're supposed to be able to pop them in. Um, I wasn't really able to pop them in myself, but the guy that did the replacement for me, Peter, over at uh, my Velo chair, um, he was able to pop them in with i'm not gonna say relatively ease but it wasn't overly hard for him um so he put the green ones in the back wheel now the front wheel that came off that was during the uh, mermaid parade and i was you know there was a nice clear area where there wasn't a lot of people so i you know i started showing off doing uh doing uh sharp turns uh figure eights and stuff like that and i i turned my motor on to give myself a little bit of speed i was on eco and i was you know i was skidding out or doing my best to skid out and that wheel just popped right off and uh that's the one that went flat so uh when peter put it on he used the uh the red pins originally i had the black pins on it which are way too small but he used the red pins which fit in really tight and it still popped off so uh when he put it back on for me he used the blue pins which are a little bit smaller than the red pins uh -huh. but it allowed for a little bit more flex i guess I, i'm not quite sure why but he said that they should work better um than the red pins all right. So, all right. So hoping. let's let's let, yeah. Let's hope this. So, what's the status right now? Let's bring us up to date on the on on your status with us. So now you have two apparently good Tannis tires, and you're hoping for the best with them. Well, three tires. It's a truck. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, well, I uh, I went on a cruise last week, and uh, it was uh, Friday that I got the the tires. I took them in and took them to Peter and had him fix them. So I haven't even had a chance to get them back You've on the bike. I'm going to get them on tonight, and hopefully right. I'll ride this week. 
All right. Now you uh, transport your trike uh, with yeah. uh, something that you worked on yourself. And that, I think that's what we're talking about here. What's this about? That is my uh, trike carrier. Um, it's a, uh, basically, it's a luggage carrier from Harbor Freight. And I've got a piece of uh, aluminum angle, angle bar on the back for the uh, back wheel to come on. There's actually two of them. So they kind of fit together like this. So the, the wheel sits into it. Hang on a second. Let's uh, go ahead. There, show us how it goes. Oh, so, uh, so there's actually two pieces of angle iron. So uh, they come together like that and they overlap. Well, it's kind of hard to do. They overlap on each other. Okay. We'll go back to the it's pictures. So, we can see it. <laughs> so uh, but the, the back, the back tire fits in it pretty well. And then the front tire fits into the, uh, the PVC rectangle there, the two front tires, and it holds it really securely. I just strap it down and uh, I've taken it several hundred miles on it altogether. All right. Now, do you have a, I can't remember, do you have a video on building that? Yes, I do. I thought so. Okay. So we'll, when we link to your channel, so people can go and see how that goes. That's and there's me, a yeah. shot. Yeah. There's a shot of it actually strapped on there. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's move along. What's, what do we got next on the uh, slideshow here? All right. So you mentioned uh, yes. my velo chair. So this is another video of yours, an interesting kind of concept here. Tell us what this is about. These things, I, all I can say about these things are they are the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, they're going to help a lot of people. Um, they are, they're basically recumbent quads, but they're small enough and they fold up compact enough. Or, well, they fold up compact enough. You can pretty much put them in any car, but they're small enough that you can ride them around your house. You ride them up to your dinner table. Um, they're great for people who uh, are disabled, people who can possibly stand or walk a little bit, um, people who are slightly amb ambulatory, uh, which is actually the majority of people in the wheelchair. When I posted this video, uh, the majority of comments I got were, if you can pedal, you don't need a wheelchair. And that's not true. The majority of the vast majority of people who require wheelchairs, they are somewhat ambulatory. They can move their legs. They can walk a little bit. They can stand. They just can't walk well. Um, they have some problems. They can't walk well or they can't walk distances. Um, and so the wheelchair gives them the mobility that they need in life. And this thing, this thing is just going to, it's going to change so many lives because not only does it give them the mobility, but it's also going to keep their, uh, their legs from uh, atrophying, which is just, it's a phenomenal idea. The, the inventor of this, Ken, he's disabled. It came up, he, he was an extremely active person. And I don't remember exactly what, ha what uh, caused it. Uh, I believe it was a disease, but I'm not 100% sure. But he can stand, he can walk a little bit with assistance from, you know, hanging onto things or a, a crutch or a cane, but he can't walk much. And he came up with this idea. He built, I don't have a photo of it, but he built this really amazing prototype, all aluminum. And um, then he, he dealt with uh, Utah trikes to build all the prototypes for these and all the frames for these. And uh, he went through a couple of prototypes until he, he found this. And they have a, a trademark on the steering system. The steering system is... Is, is kind of tank is a kind of tank tank steering back exactly it's like a tank steering you can yeah. and you I can steer with one arm on, it turns on a dime i mean like oh, right around yes, it itself does. too so inside is each actually which is where you showed it off right there you go yes. thank you trey all right that's great um is that the last shot we have of that i think oh that's my wife writing it yep yep all right so that's is that it trey on that one okay great all right let me uh let's go back thank you yeah that's the shot i want uh let's finish up if we can jason with okay. a couple questions about your future plans so uh i mentioned in your introduction about touring it's one of the things you talked about very early on you have mm -hmm. you have some overall big time goals don't you so tell me about your your biggest goals and and uh, and your and your plans for touring well, I mean, I, I have a 400-mile tour coming up. I'm going to uh, trike the um, Erie Canal Trail. And that's uh, – it was supposed to be a, a month or two ago, but things got pushed back. So um, it's going to be this summer, though. I'm going to do it. And uh, that's the immediate goal to do that. I mean, eventually I'd like to uh, trike around the country, but the hardest part about that isn't going to be the triking part. The hardest part about that is going to be convince my wife to let me do it. So <laughs> I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I just enjoy writing it. I want to write it, uh, everywhere I can. Okay. That sounds great. Now, specifically back to your YouTube channel. Um, you're really, your reviews are really good that you try stuff out yourself, show it very well. And, Thank you. and you get, so what, do you have any, uh, reviews coming up? You want to kind of hint at here? 
Well, I I don't know if you could really call it a review. I've uh, when I was on uh, when I was on vacation on the cruise, one of the excursions we took was a uh, sea cycle. So we took pedal boats out into the ocean, um, and that was a lot of fun. And I filmed it. Um, I've, so that's going to be a vlog coming up. So if you're you know if you're interested in learning more about sea cycling, which is a lot of fun, you know you can watch that. All right, and uh, Joe is uh, I think referring to I think he's referring to the velo chair as far as the great gadget goes. So thanks for that, Joe. And yeah, let me, uh, as we finish up with Jason, remind all of our viewers out there that uh, the live chat is ongoing. Thank you for sending in the comments. Keep them coming. And as we continue the show, we'll put them up uh, on the screen for you. Thanks for doing that. All right, uh, Jason, uh, I wish you uh, so much luck with your uh, YouTube channel. It's growing Thank quickly, you. it looks like. Uh, you're doing a great job. I'll keep watching and I hope our viewers will as well. I'll keep watching you too. All right, we appreciate that. <laughs> we'll keep an eye on each other then. So great. thanks, thanks for, for coming on the Laid Back Bike Report. Yeah, we appreciate it. So long, Jason. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. All right. So yeah, let's see. VeloVet 360. I would love to trike around the country too. So yeah, I think that's a lot of it's a lot of people's bucket list uh, on a lot of people's bucket list items, isn't it? So, all right. So let's move along here to. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know what? I have. Uh, okay, this we don't really need Jason for this, but I did get a comment or uh, from Ron Thompson via email when he saw that we were going to be talking about Tannis tires. Let me read this for you guys. Just a personal experience comment on Tannis tires. I installed two 700C uh, by 32 uh, millimeter tires on my custom front wheel drive bent. I used the bike uh, for twice weekly casual training rides with two buddies. Thought the Tannis would be great because a flat front tire is a little hard to replace on that bike. The tires were a bit of work to install, which is uh, actually what uh, Jason talked about. They rode okay. Handling was a bit off, but not terrible. In summary, I thought it would be a solution. And then I rode uh, with the guys. Ouch, the rolling resistance on these tires was so high, I could not keep up. Now, we'd done this ride literally hundreds of times, and this never happened before. And it is actually a casual pace, about uh, 16 miles an hour over 20 miles, about 900 feet of climbing. So, he says, nice try, Tannis, but I'm afraid this is not the right solution for my application, at least. Uh, unless maybe I can get my buddies to buy sets, too. So, all right. So, not the not the best uh, rousing uh, uh, approval of Tannis tires uh, on today's show, but we'll see what happens if you guys have uh, more experience, let us know about it. And now we are going to move on uh, to our next featured guest. He is from uh, Toronto and has a degree in mechanical engineering. He's also a fellow YouTuber and has created some great bike maintenance and touring videos using his uh, linear long wheelbase. I think you'll quickly see why his channel has over 9 million views as we say hello to CJ Hoyle. CJ, are you there? There we go. Hi, Gary. Good to see you. It well, is great to have me on. My friend. It's great to have you on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I meant everything I said. I'm intrigued by your channel and uh, and what you do. You do such a competent job of, of showing everybody what goes on. And I know you do a lot of voiceovers and stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about how you do that a little bit later on. And uh, folks, we're going to bring uh, Peter Stoll on, I think, uh, during this interview. Hello, Peter. You there? Hi, I'm here. All right. Because uh, CJ uh, and Peter have had yeah. some dealings because CJ uh, has a linear. So <laughs> Peter, if you just kind of hang on and then if you want to interject as, sure. uh, as CJ is talking, uh, we can have a little conversation about the linears or whatever, uh, or maybe about the story itself. But we're going we're gonna to go to CJ at this point. If you can solo him for me. Uh, and I'm going to just ask a few questions about your background to start out with, uh, so we know, learn a little bit about you, CJ. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel and uh, what your history is with Recumbent Bikes. And let's go ahead and throw, uh, let's see, do we, yeah, let's get the slides up. Uh, CJ's got the slides. There we go. All okay. right. Yep. And uh, let's go. Go ahead, yeah, CJ. Yeah, so I've been making YouTube videos for about nine years now. And um, my YouTube channel is always just kind of, you know, centered around my hobbies. And one of my biggest hobbies is cycling. So I've always made a lot of sort of bike related videos. So I'll just kind of give you a preview of what you might see if you went to my YouTube channel. So three kind of areas of uh, uh, videos that you might see would be bike maintenance tutorials. You mentioned them. I make videos, you know, 
teaching people how to uh, repair their own bikes uh, at home. I also make narrated cycling videos. So in this, uh, this shot here, you can see that I have a, an earpiece microphone on my face, and I also have a camera mounted on my bike. And in these videos, I'm just riding, you know, riding down the street and I'm basically talking and I'm describing the things around me and I'm telling stories. And the idea of those videos is to try and start to bring the viewer in to sort of make them feel like they're, you know, riding right, right there beside me and we're having a conversation. Um, so people seem to enjoy those videos. It sort of gives them a sense of, you know, what it's like riding in the places that I visit. I've done these um, in a couple different cities around the world. Um, and, and you other, are based. You are based in, near Toronto, right? So we have a little bit focused as to where you are. Is that right? Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, that's right. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Uh, so I've done a lot of videos in and around um, Toronto, uh, but I also did those videos when I went to New York City. I think I have about nine of them in New York City, and I did one in Amsterdam, and one in <laughs> Chicago, and one in Boston, and uh, one in Calgary in Canada. So yeah, I, I try and you know bring the camera with me when I when I travel other places. Super. Okay, let's go back to the slideshow and let CJ go. Go. Let's, let's go. So speaking of travel, I also do bike uh, tours, and so far I've done a lot of touring around my my home. Uh, province of Ontario. Um, so I make videos about them. They're a little bit different than the narrated cycling videos uh, because in those videos, I um, basically edit them down. So they're very condensed and very digestible. And I basically cover an entire day of a tour in about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, so I posted, uh, I've done three tour series uh, from those different trips. Uh, this particular one here was a 10 day trip that I did. Uh, all three of the ones I've done so far have all been in, in Ontario. So now I think uh, I'll, I'll sort of talk about a little bit of history and how I kind of got here. Um, so cycling has always been a pretty big part of my life. It was just part of what my family did. My parents did a lot of cycling before they had kids. And uh, I gravitated towards cycling quite a bit when I was uh, very young. This is you can see me sitting on the back of our uh, family tandem on a trip that we did um, some time. Uh, when I was in my teenage years, I was really into mountain biking, and my very first job uh, ever was working at a day camp uh, that was focused on, on mountain biking, and I was a mountain bike instructor. So I, I taught kids how to ride bikes, how to be safe when they're out on the, on the trail. Um, and another component of that job, which was really interesting to me, was uh, doing the bike maintenance repairs on the bikes that the camp owned. So the bike, that, you know, the camp had probably about 30 bikes, and every morning, you know, someone had to go in and take all the bikes out from the shop and put them outside, and while doing that, we needed to inspect them and do any repairs that were, were necessary. So I was always kind of mechanically inclined and I like fixing things, but this is the first time I was really doing this, you know, on a regular basis um, and, uh, you know, really getting comfortable working on bikes. Uh, all right, so now fast forwarding a little bit for, further forward, and this is now I'm in university, and this is the bike that I rode throughout university, a very uh, junky kind of bike, the kind of bike that I paid $35 for, and uh, I locked it up all around campus, not really worrying that it would get stolen, and wasn't worried about it getting, you know, you know, rained on or snowed on or anything like that. Hey, the so, center of gravity on that bike's about up by your ears, isn't it, CJ? <laughs> approximately, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a load of groceries. Uh, you know, every every week I had to get some groceries for for, uh, for throughout the week, and uh, that's that's how I carried it. Okay. Uh, so now another thing I did in university was I started volunteering at, they had a do-it-yourself bike shop uh, right on campus. And uh, the interesting thing about that was that uh, unlike what I did when I was a mountain bike instructor, someone would come in with a broken bike. And the one rule was that I wasn't allowed to work on their bike. All I could do was teach them. I could just give them instruction on how to fix their bikes, which kind of uh, segued in, into me eventually making my, my own YouTube videos, um, being able to teach other people that didn't happen to come into the bike shop how to fix things. So now we're fast forwarding even forward, I, even further forward. I'm now graduated from university and I'm working full time and I've, I've moved uh, to Canada's largest city. And uh, I should mention that um, throughout university, my bike was my means of transportation. It was my vehicle. And I like that. I enjoyed being car free. Uh, so when I graduated, I moved to yeah, Canada's largest city and I decided I, I didn't want to buy a car. I wanted to continue using my bike as my primary mode of transportation. And this is the bike that I used to use getting back and forth every day to work uh, 12 months of the year, even here in Canada, where it gets down very cold and there's snow and you can see there's some frost accumulating on my beard there. <laughs> Another thing that I do here in Toronto is I volunteer with an organization called Cycle Toronto, and I'm really involved with bike advocacy. So we we push we push for safer streets, more bike lanes, making it safer, getting more people you know out uh, using bikes as a legit, legitimate form of transportation. 
I also decided, even though I was using my bike mostly just for utilitarian purposes, for transportation, I also kind of wanted to to also try doing a tour. I hadn't really done any tours of my own since I was, you know, pretty young with my family. Uh, so I kind of wanted to just, I had a couple extra vi- days of vacation at the end of a year, and I decided that I'd do a six-day bike trip. Uh, so this is the road bike that I rode at the time, and it was a great trip. I love the scenery. I love getting away from the city. I love, you know, just seeing places I'd never seen before in that sort of mode of transportation. But unfortunately, by day two, uh, my hands and my wrists got very sore, and I really should have quit then. I really should have, you know, basically if your body's telling you something you should listen to it and i didn't and uh that's uh if you're gonna take anything away from my presentation today it's that uh because my hands and my wrists have never been quite the same since then they've always uh that that, that pain has come back and and come back many times and uh in fact uh in the city uh i wasn't even able to do my my regular commute anymore Uh, i got that bad that i was i wasn't really riding my bike uh, at all but then of course as we know recumbents are a great solution to many problems with the body and uh, so I decided I would look to see what I could find um, online. So basically, when I had the problems earlier, I, I had been trying doing different adaptations to my regular bikes, you know, putting putting higher handlebars, putting softer grips, you know, very, doing various different things like that to, to work. And those things would sort of work for a little while, but they would, you know, eventually, um, you know, the pain would eventually, you know, sort of come back. So um, I wasn't con- totally convinced that a recumbent was going to work just because of all my negative experiences with, with things failing before. So the used market seemed like the best uh, approach for me because I knew I'd be able to buy a bike and try it for a few months. And if I didn't like it, I'd be able to sell it. And there wouldn't be, you know, too much depreciation on it, given that, you know, it's already a used bike that I've just purchased. So this bike is one that popped up uh, for sale in my local listing service, and uh, I instantly fell in love with it. Uh, So this is an Iowa Linear. It's a 1992 Iowa Linear. And what I loved about it was that it had underseat steering. So I knew that trikes had underseat steering, but I was really mostly interested in a bike. And this is the first one that I had ever seen that had underseat steering. So I, of course, I instantly fell in love with it. And um, so I, you know, contacted the seller, and we made a plan. We had a great conversation on the phone about the bike, and you know, I, I made plans to go and buy this bike from him. And uh, unfortunately, to make a long story short, he ended up selling it to somebody else and not to me. So my heart was broken. I didn't get to buy this bike that I was really looking forward to getting. So I went back to the used market and I ended up buying this bike here. Uh, so this is a, another long wheelbase uh, underseat steering bike. And um, it's kind of a unique bike. And we'll talk a little bit about who made the bike in a moment. But um, it's uh, basically pretty similar to the linear. Uh, it's got underseat steering. Uh, one difference, though, is that it has a, a 20 inch back wheel. Um, but the main thing that, that, that basically didn't work for me was this bike was a little bit too small for me probably about five centimeters or so and the seat couldn't go back any further there wasn't any you know thing i could really do to it uh to you know improve the bike to make it fit me better um so although it was great because i got to ride it around uh and i could confirm that i was able to ride you know long distances and i'd have no problems with my hands and wrists the problems that i would had on all other bikes i had ridden before that, but unfortunately i was getting pain in my knees because i wasn't getting full extension uh, of my legs when i was riding so this was kind of a, a nice experiment, but I eventually ended up reselling this bike. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about the maker of this bike. Uh, so the company that made it is called Lightning Cycle Incorporated. And now this is not the same Lightning company that makes recumbents today that sponsors this program. This is a different company that operated uh, back in the 1990s uh, that made bikes, uh, recumbent bikes uh, on, on, the, uh, on the East Coast in Ohio. Thank you very much for pointing out the uh, differentiation there. Uh, I appreciate that a lot because we do not want to confuse that. But it is really interesting. And uh, you see it's made in Ohio. It's not far from where we are, actually. It's, and and uh, I'll just interject something real quickly. I'll let you get back. Uh, to it, CJ, but uh, CJ didn't mention, I don't know if he will, but so this was the focus of another another of his uh, 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 videos, a really interesting one. He'll talk about uh, in that video uh, about the bike like he's talking now and show you all the little details, uh, the idiosyncrasies of this bike as well. I recommend, <laughs> I recommend all his videos, but this was a particularly interesting one. So go ahead, CJ, I'm sorry. No, thanks for that, Gary. That's uh, yeah, yeah. As, as you said, many of the things in 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 what I'm covering today, most of these images were taken from videos that I've made before. So if you want any, any more detail about anything I'm talking about, go to my channel and and search search it up because there's yeah plenty of information on there about anything. So I went back to the used market and I ended up um, 
seeing another linear for sale. And this time I didn't want to take any chances. I contacted the seller immediately and I made plans right away to go and get it because I didn't want to have the same bad experience where he would sell it to some, someone else. And I actually had to drive to Ottawa to buy this, which is a five hour drive. Um, and it turns out this is actually the same bike that I almost bought before. Uh, so the guy that the other guy sold it to had it for a few months and decided that he didn't want it. So he then resold it to me. So now I got to finally be the owner of the bike that I had fallen in love with previously. And it was everything I dreamed of. It was uh, like the like the lightning I just showed before. It was great. My hands and my wrists had no problems whatsoever. And the bike actually fit me properly. So I wasn't getting the problems with my with my knees that I had uh, with the other. And another really great thing that I like about, about the linear. I had to bring this three shot on because <laughs> if you guys can't see Peter smiling, you'll never see him smile like this. Go ahead, CJ. You're going to keep him smiling, I'm sure. Another great thing that, that the linear had that the other bike didn't have was that it's the seat is very high up which I guess is a disadvantage if you're a shorter rider. But for me, being a five foot ten or, or so, uh, for riding in the city, it makes a real difference because I'm up higher. I can see over top of, you know, vehicles when I'm, you know, going around a corner or things like that. And they can see me a lot better, too. So it's a really good bike for in the city. Uh, so I rode it as my daily commuting bike back in that summer. This is the summer of 2017. And this picture really illustrates, well, that's my mom riding there beside me. We just did a, a ride out in the country one day. And look how our heads are parallel to one another. So unlike a lot of bent you know, recumbents where you're really low to the ground, I'm just as high as she is. So I have really good visibility there. So yeah, I absolutely love this bike. I rode it for the entire summer, but if you happen to go to the linear website and read about Iowa linears, you'll know that they have a little bit of a problem that uh, they're prone to having fatigue failures. And this Iowa linear suffered the same uh, fate that many others did and it had a fatigue crack that started to form here. Uh, so I had different ideas about how I might be able to repair it or um, different ideas, but I also continued to look in the used market to see what else I could find out there uh, in the meantime. And I ended up seeing this bike pop up on the market uh, down in Rochester, actually. Uh, and I, this bike looked like exactly what I wanted because it was very similar to the bike, my previous bike, um, but it has a reinforced, this, this is a New York linear. So I guess one of the first bikes that, that Peter's- uh, yeah, one, of the, one of the very first, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it so it uses a lot of the Iowa parts, but it has a reinforcing U bracket uh, at the back. So it's reinforcing that area that had fatigued uh, on my existing linear. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I, I rode this bike, I got it. I felt like I, now I have a bomb-proof bike. I can I can ride it wherever I want. So I took it on um, you know tours around. Uh, I also use it as my daily you know my my daily bike for just going places. This is a picture taken. I went to a friend's wedding uh, in a neighboring suburb of Toronto. It was about a 45 kilometer ride or so, and uh, not really good public transit to get there. So I decided I would ride my bike there. So that's my suit that's hanging there uh, from my milk crate there at the back, and I had some musical instruments that I brought with me, um, but. It, for, it served as a very great uh, primary vehicle for me, uh, remaining car-free uh, in my urban environment where I live. So uh, yeah, as I was saying, I, now I had a bomb-proof bike that I felt like, okay, now I can take a bike touring, I can go out on the road, I can you know, get away, I can use my vacation and, and, and go and kind of do what I had done on that previous tour that I talked about where I had the problems. As I said, I enjoyed everything about that trip except for the pain in my hands and wrists that I had. So now I was able to do that once again and I absolutely loved it and I've made videos about that about those trips and I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit later, but we'll continue talking about my journey with recumbents. So after a summer of riding this bike, and again, this is a used bike that I bought, so you never really know what you're getting with a used bike. It could have, you know, been in all kinds of crashes, or it could have been ridden by a guy that weighs twice as much as I weigh. You never really know, you know, what's going to happen. Um, but unfortunately, I discovered that there was a crack that started to form in one of the welds. And when I looked closer, I saw that there was another crack that had formed down here as well. So I was disappointed because you know i felt like i had a, a bike that was going to last me uh you know forever and and i was going to take it on lots more tours and now all of a sudden i didn't so i i sent these pictures to to peter uh, at the bicycle man who um you know his his company is the one that, that you know originally made this bike although this is one of their very first bikes that they made and um maybe peter you can jump in and see what your reaction was when you when you saw the pictures it was the first time we saw one of our bikes crack and still the only time that <clears throat> i was just really surprised the the top weld that cracked is not a high stress area. And I'm, I'm not convinced that that crack didn't form as the weld cooled when it was right, when it was being manufactured. The other crack is certainly a high stress area and it's right at the, at the intersection. It's in the heat affected zone of that weld there. So, uh, 
that that one is going to the bottom one that's shown in this picture that's going to propagate and cause trouble in the future right uh so so i knew that that was a problem and i wouldn't be able to you know do more tours on this so peter's suggestion was he he stood by the quality of his product and he gave me a very good uh deal on purchasing a new frame uh for my bike so i could rebuild the bike so i drove down to we, my, my dad and i drove down to alfred station new york and uh this is the frame that I ended up buying. So well, it was a uh, fun day. <laughs> it was, yes. So, and, and I should just say that that uh, you know I had been really disappointed when I when I saw that the the crack was there, and I you know I felt like oh man, now I don't have a bike anymore. But as soon as I had talked to Peter, I instantly was just energized and excited again because not only was I going to solve my problem, but I had a fun project to work on because <laughs> the prospect of building a, a bike, you know, from the ground up is, uh, you know, it was it was it really appealed to me. So um, and I made a video on, on this build here, but I'll just give you a very, uh, you know, a couple highlights to the, the build. So the frame came, you know, just unfinished just basically it had been you know welded together and that was about it so the the metal was kind of rough so i started off by sanding it and i did all just hand sanding uh, on it it took about a week to get you know all the way from 200 grit up to, to 600 grit to get it uh, really nice and smooth to prepare it for finish but uh again even that was 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 still fun to do just seeing it you know uh, gradually transitioning to be uh very you know nice and shiny and i decided just like my last bike, which was silver, I kind of wanted to keep it like that. I, I could have painted it, you know, any color in the rainbow, but I thought that um, that um, that a clear coat would probably be a better idea. Um, mainly because, as you've seen, I use my bike for in the city. I'm always locking it up places, and people at bike racks are not always very, you know, respectful of other bikes. And unfortunately, bikes get scratched a lot. So I knew that if I had a, you know, a brand new bike with a with a, you know, perfect paint job on it, that I would be hesitant to lock it up, and I. You know, I wanted to use this bike. I didn't want to, you know, leave it as a, a display piece. So uh, I figured that a clear coat would work well because if it gets scratched off, then you've still got silver underneath and it looks, you know, pretty much the same. So that's what I ended up doing. And here I'm applying the, the linear decal that, that Peter gave me to install on it. So a couple of unique things about uh, about installing this um, on, on my bike, uh, you can see that uh, so I put a rack, I want to put a rack on there so I could use it for, for cargo. And uh, the way that the, the previous rack, and this is something that the, one of the previous owners of the bike had done, uh, they use this particular rack that fastens sort of in a unique way where the uh, part of the frame is, is attaching back here uh, and attached to a hole that just happened to be here in the frame. Well, the new bike didn't have that. So what I did instead was I took one of these holes Holes that just cut there, I'm guessing just to, to save weight. And I filled it with a, a plastic plug that I made. Uh, and then I was able to insert a bolt through there. And I used these longer pieces of aluminum uh, to fasten it that way. Yeah, we've done the same thing to attach the uh, the uh, reaction arm from a roll-off hub to a to a linear this vein, uh, the, you know, like your new frame. It works out real well. Now yeah. the new the new linears are they have the roll-off compatible dropout, so it's simpler. But that's a good that's a good retrofit. It's neat working with a, a, a engineer who's got a project of his own and kind of watching him work through things. And that's a pretty good mount. I like it. Thanks. Let me just quickly interject. We got a comment here from uh, Ken Kaiser saying he rebuilt his first trike onto a new frame and learned a great deal about trikes and their maintenance. So, I mean, that's an important point, isn't it? So uh, you've had a lot of experience, CJ, but. Uh, would you say you'd recommend uh, doing this? And Peter, you can jump in too, for as not only knowing more about the bike or trike that you're using, but as a learning experience uh, for the future in terms of maintenance and such. Does that make sense? Well, I think it's 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 good. If, if it's something that you're into, then it's a great project. I remember when I was talking to Peter on the phone, he said, are you the kind of person that like is interested in doing a project or would you rather just have a working bike? And I said, oh, I'm definitely the project type. So I think it really depends on, you know, your, your own personality. Um, but certainly knowing how your bike works and, and how to fix it is important, uh, particularly if you're if you're touring, for example, you know, if something yeah. breaks, you, you got to, you know, <clears throat> you're not, you can't guarantee that you're going to be able to find a, a bike shop or B, a bike shop that knows about recumbents uh, that would be able to really fix it for you. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's been a couple instances I've seen on your videos too, CJ, where you have uh, kind of come up with some uh, ad hoc solutions <laughs> from hardware stores when you've had some problems uh, with your uh, with your ride at the time. And we're going to highlight some of those when let's we get to the All section. right, yeah. let's go ahead. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to work on your bike if you have mechanical aptitude. 
um, you know, you're touring and you're learning about your bike and it's good. You learn things like, uh, you know, like that you don't touch the, the disc with your fingers because the oils of your fingers get in the disc break. So then you clean it off. If you do touch it, then you clean it off with alcohol, right? Uh, otherwise it'll blah, blah, blah. Anyway, better to clean it off. Yep. Yeah. So then uh, the other thing I would say is that there are some people that don't have a lot of mechanical aptitude and they might very well get hurt by assembling something incorrectly. So if you're not really confident in your ability, then you should take it to a professional mechanic and have it checked before you actually go out and ride it. Because it is very possible to get hurt in a bicycle if it's not assembled correctly. Great point. Yep. Okay. Let's right, so, move along there. Yep. Yeah. So I'll just highlight a few other unique things about the linear. I mean, there's a, I have a, you know, 10 minute or so video showing every little step that I did. Um, but I'll just sort of highlight some of the unique things that uh, sort of made were unique to the, the linear and a couple things that I did uniquely to the bike. Uh, so I decided I wanted to have a 700 C uh, back wheel where my, my first linear, the gold one, it had a 700 C wheel. The second one I had had a 26 inch wheel and I preferred the 700. So that's what I decided to put on, on this bike. Um, so what that one challenge that that gave was that although there was enough clearance for the tire there wasn't really too much space for the fenders to get installed so i had to modify my fenders and separate them into two pieces so that the fender didn't go through that you know that that tight spot in there so that's the bottom half of the fender there and then in here you can see i'm fastening the other half of it uh so they, they both kind of connect there and the fender doesn't continuously go uh, over that part of the frame but that gives you the clearance to be able to have fenders and uh, of course i you know i like to have fenders on, on my bike uh for you know riding in the city riding in the rain uh, or on tours of course you're, you're often riding in, in rain as well Another unique thing was that, so the seat, this when the new frame was designed, it was designed for a newer seat to be installed. Uh, but my older seat could still fit on it, but I needed to do a little bit to make it fit as well. Uh, you can see here that the point where the, the seat, um, the, the seat strut at the back mounts on the newer frame, which is on the, on the left, uh, it mounts lower than the position of the seat on the, on the, on the right. Uh, so what I ended up doing was I made a longer uh, piece there for the lower part of the, of the strut. It's a, and it, it's a collapsible or a, a telescoping tube, so you can adjust it to different heights. So I just made a, a, longer, a longer piece there to, uh, to replace it. Another thing I did was I decided I wanted to, of course, I make videos as, as we in, talked about in my introduction. So I wanted to be able to film videos and I wanted a really neat and clean way of mounting my camera. So I decided uh, I wanted to make a mount and the, the material that seemed the most appropriate was plastic. And I decided I would try 3D printing for the first time. So I, I, uh, my local library has a 3D printer that you can, uh, that you can use. And um, I, I learned how to you know, model things in 3D and I created this mount, which uh, works really well for that. So my bike was completed finally, and I was able to ride it. And I was—I really had to uh, uh, wait patiently for the the salt to be off the roads because I didn't want to ride. Uh, this happened back in in March, uh, so I, I uh, had the bike finished for a while before I could actually uh, ride it when the roads were not uh, not salty. All right. So now we'll talk about some of my tours uh, that I've done. Um, oh, over could the I last just two interject years. for a minute? Of course. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> We, you know, for when we bought linear from Iowa, they made folding bikes and there were some problems with the bikes. So we decided to make them welded bikes. We were really focused on making them durable. We made the first bike like his first one was, which that one's the only one we've seen that cracked. That one, we, we, we stopped making that and we made the new one like his new frame. And uh, then we switched to uh, making folding bikes again, but it's a wider frame. It's a different beam. A lot of the parts from the welded bikes don't fit. So now we have some welded frames left and we're running out of parts to go on them. So we're running a sale for anybody that wants to take an Iowa bike and upgrade it to a, a new uh, New York welded linear bike with a disc brake in the back, $500 for a frame. And then pretty much everything you've got will fit on there. And you've got yourself a, a new frame. If you've got a rear frame that's broken on an Iowa bike, there are no replacements, but this uh, gets you a new bike pretty economically. And no. the procedure to do that would be pretty much what I showed in my video. So yep, and I was going to say, and there's an instructional <laughs> video some guy in Canada has posted. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's a great one. So it, it's step yes, by it step. Is. So it seems like a good it seems like a good process to if you if you're looking to either replace or even uh, start up new, it's a great way to get started at a reasonable price. So, all right, Peter, thank you, and uh, go ahead. Anything else, Peter? I was just going to say that we have painted frames for five hundred and unpainted for four fifty. Okay. So there's some, and we're running out of sizes, blah, blah, blah. Give us a call. 
Okay. You can and meet have, it, you know, with the linear recumbent website or bicycle man website, whichever. And we've got those links uh, in the, uh, okay. in the That's description fine. below as always. So, all right. I think as we get on with uh, CJ's uh, touring section, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and put you backstage for now, if that's okay, Peter. That's great. And uh, thanks for CJ. chiming in. All right. Yeah. So, so I, I started doing touring again uh, last summer when I had that, that first, uh, first silver linear that I had and I did, I've done three tours, um, on it, uh, or well, one tour this summer with my newer linear, but I've done, I guess, three linear tours, I guess you'd say, uh, this is the first one I did. So I've made videos about these. So I'm just going to give you a couple highlights on, on each of the three tours. So this is the first one you can see, I started up, up, uh, over here. This is, uh, Burlington, Ontario. So just outside of, uh, of Toronto. And I did a loop, which came down here and this is Lake Ontario. At the bottom, that is Lake Erie. And in the top left, that is Lake Huron. So I got to see three of the Great Lakes in this trip. And it was nine days. Each of the different colors represents a different day. So a couple of the highlights from some photos. Uh, this is me uh, at Niagara Falls, which is uh, a great landmark, of course. This is... Oops. Next slide. This is me um, riding next to Lake Erie. There's some really great uh, quiet roads that run right up along beside the lake, which are a lot of fun to ride on. This is the other Great Lake, uh, the third Great Lake. This is Lake Huron. Uh, I stayed at a provincial park called uh, Pinery Provincial Park. And uh, from there, you've got a perfect view out looking on the lake when the sun sets below the water. Uh, so pretty much a nice sunset every, every day uh, from there at Pinery. Another nice highlight from that trip was a town called St. Mary's. I just, uh, I mean, I really love going into small little towns, but this one was particularly nice. Nice, And as it says, it's St. Mary's, the town worth living in, because uh, it's just simply that beautiful. The second tour I did last summer, this is, I did this uh, other loop where I went in kind of a, a, a counterclockwise direction of this loop. Again, every color represents a different day of the trip. I took a train from Toronto to a, a suburb of Toronto called Aurora, and I rode up, this lake here is called Lake Simcoe, and then I rode up and I went on to this water body, which is part of Lake Huron. Uh, it's called uh, Georgian Bay. Um, and then I rode along here, and I cut across over to here, and then I rode along Lake Huron and back, and then through the um, interior of uh, Ontario. This is riding up again, similar to Lake Erie. You get to ride right up along beside the lake for various different parts. This is Lake Simcoe. Uh, I saw a lot of, uh, this is a bird called an osprey, which makes these very large nests. They're quite big birds. Uh, I took my bike on a water taxi uh, to a national park called Georgian Bay Islands National Park, uh, which is located on an island called Beausoleil Island. Uh, so that's a really neat experience being on a, you know, a water access only um, you know, campground. That was a, a lot of fun as well. This is Wasaga Beach, which is uh, the world's longest freshwater beach. This is a waterfall called Sobble Falls. We can go and uh, at one of the provincial parks, we can go and swim in the waterfall. This is a nice town called uh, Kincardine. I actually have some family that lives here. So I got to, on that tour, um, passing through Kincardine, I got to stay with them and, and visit with my family. Another really nice town on uh, Lake Huron is Goderich, which I also saw for the first time on this trip. Really, really interesting town. And on my way back, I rode through Mennonite country. So I saw, you know, lots of horses and buggies and lots of Mennonite farms. And I've always found the, the Amish and Mennonites uh, really interesting. So now moving on to my final trip, the tour that I did back in May, which I just finished posting the videos for um, about uh, two weeks ago or so. And I did this one in, uh, so I kind of went west of, sorry, I went east of Toronto. So Toronto's here. And I did the loop in, again, the counter uh, counterclockwise direction. And um, yeah, so I basically followed kind of the waterfront along uh, Lake Ontario uh, as far as it goes to when it becomes Lake, uh, when it becomes the St. Lawrence River. Then I headed north and I went through this area, which is uh, a lot of rocks and trees. This is part of the, the Canadian Shield. Uh, and then I sort of made my way back down and then I sort of worked my way back through through farmland uh, back to uh, back to Aurora again, where I took a, a train. You'll notice that my trips always start at sort of start and end just outside of uh, my city. And that's because we have a great uh, commuter rail service here where you can just take your bike and put it on a train and it's you don't have to buy a ticket. You just show up and you get on and uh, you, it gets you like out of the out of the, you know, the suburbia. And uh, that's a really nice way to do it. So just a couple of highlights from there. Uh, this is one of the, a small town called uh, Port Hope, which is a really you know beautiful small town on Lake Ontario. 
Uh, but unfortunately, on my first day of that trip, uh, just while I was in Port Hope, I noticed that my rack, which we talked about earlier, uh, was sort of sitting at a funny angle. And uh, I mean, this is the first time I had really subjected this this rack to, uh, you know, carrying a full full self-supported cargo. Uh, so, you know, with a tent and probably about, in total, about 50 pounds of cargo uh, on that rack. And unfortunately, that rack has started to bend in these areas uh, down here. And you can see up close that some of the tubes is, have actually uh, actually crushed and actually there's cracks in there. So this is my first day of my trip and I've got, you know, eight days left to go and I've got a rack that's not working. And I was really, really worried. Uh, but I, you know, stayed, stayed cool and calm. And I thought about, OK, what can we do here? Uh, because, you know, getting that rack to fit on my bike was a real challenge, like we talked about earlier. Um, so I couldn't just buy another rack and sort of replace it. Um, so I had to find a way that I could fix this rack. So what I ended up doing was if I broke those ends off, I could see that they were hollow on the inside. And from the hardware store, I bought a, a quarter inch bolt. I cut the heads off of them. I bought a hacksaw too. And then I epoxied those inside there. So basically the weak point of the rack is now being reinforced by a you know, a piece of steel, a stronger material than the aluminum that it was originally uh, made from. And uh, you can see, I just put epoxy on the outside uh, to seal it together. And with that solution, I felt like this is going to work. And uh, well, it did. I got through the rest of the, the nine days. And in fact, I still have that rack on my bike right now. I'm still in the process of, of uh, switching it out with another one. So it's, it's still holding up. So um, like we talked about before, you know, when it's good to know, you know, these sort of things, if, if, if problems happen, because, you know, in Port Hope, if I take into a bike shop, they probably wouldn't have really been able to, to do very much for me. And I'm not even sure that Port Hope has a bike shop. So um, you got to be prepared to, you know, uh, well, it's good if you, you can do these sort of repairs uh, yourself. So a couple other D highlights. DJ, if I could, uh, it might be a good point here to interrupt if I could. Um, let's bring, is Peter, you still with us? Let's bring you back in. Oop. <laughs> Thanks, Larry, you're doing it already. Uh, I've got a I've got a comment here, kind of a comment and question that I think maybe, Peter, you might be best suited to answer. So uh, talk about the weight limit uh, of the frames. You can see uh, there, here's a fan of CJ's and uh, and a new guy. And he he's looking he's asking about uh, for bigger people. So uh, what do you what do you know about the um, uh, the weight limits? The warranty weight on a linear frame is two hundred seventy five pounds and the luggage weight, if you mount the luggage on a rear rack like CJ did. As far as I'm concerned, that doesn't add to the weight on the frame. It certainly adds to the weight in the wheel, but we don't warranty the wheel against hitting curbs and things. Um, so that doesn't add to the to the warranty weight. So suppose you have a person that weighs 270 pounds, carry 50 pounds of gear. As long as the gear is on a luggage rack over the rear wheel, that doesn't affect the warranty weight of the frame. If you put the the luggage in a rack underneath the seat, then that does add to the weight, the warranty weight. So then the 270 pound person plus 50 pounds, that would go over the warranty weight of the bike. If you add it to the seat, blah, blah, blah. But you know, most people put their heavy stuff on their luggage rack in the back. So 275 and you can add your gear on top of that with a rack. And we've only only ever had one failure. We've never had a failure on our, our the the like any the frames that we currently have in stock, we've never seen a failure. We've sold those for what fifteen years, I think. So okay, very good. And uh, let's see. Oh, and this is referring to your rack, I think. Uh, the, the fix on your rack. He, he is a he is a big fan, obviously. So there you go, CJ. Thank all you. right, very good. Thank you, Peter. Um, all right, let's uh, let's go along. Another uh, some more of the touring. Uh, uh, right, yeah, I should just give a couple more more highlights from my last tour. This is a provincial park called Sandbanks. It's a really, really nice one. Um, lots of very beautiful sandy beach. And even you can see here, you can pitch your tents on the top of a sand dune. Uh, those were not my tents, but uh, I could have if I had stayed in one of those campsites if I had known. Um, I also stayed on an island called Wolf Island, which is uh, just off the, uh, just sort of off of the city of Kingston. There's an island that you take a ferry to, and it has lots of wind turbines, and uh, it's a really nice. Uh, it's basically just farmland, but it's just a, an island that's separated from the the mainland. Uh, it doesn't have a campground though, so I decided. Uh, well, I really wanted to stay there, so I decided I would try a website called um, Warm Showers, which is basically it's a it's a website which connects people that have uh, basically that are allies of people who are doing tours with people who are actually doing tours. So basically what all, all the ask is, is that if you're a host on, on warm showers that you um, are offering someone they can use, you know, your their yard to pitch your tent and you can also use their bathroom. And that's about 
all that you really need when you're touring is you just need somewhere to you know set up your tent. Uh, so I had a really great experience with with that uh, on Wolf Island. Uh, this is taken at a provincial park called Charbot Lake, and you can see I'm mid uh, diving into the water there. I just included that because for me, when I'm doing a tour, I really like to take a swim at the end of the day. You know, after you've been on the road for an entire day and you're, you know, you're tired and you're, you get there and you're celebrating that you've made, you know, your accomplishment. It's so nice to just jump into a lake and just, uh, you know, cool off in the lake there. Uh, this was taken in May and it was quite cold, but uh, it was totally worth it. Uh, this is a nice town that I visited called Napanee on my on my way back after I had sort of done that loop and I was heading west again back towards Toronto. Uh, this is something called this is called the Rainy Gorge Suspension Bridge. It's just outside of uh, a camp town called Campbellford at a provincial park called Ferris Provincial Park, and. Uh, um, yeah, so that was that was nice. Uh, now, now we're talking about other problems that happened to my bike uh, on this tour. So sh shortly after leaving that campground, I went over a very small bump, and uh, after I hit the bump, unfortunately, I felt my seat sort of give way, and one of the welds that holds it together uh, had actually unfortunately failed. And uh, you know, this was day eight, the beginning of day eight, so I still had about 200 kilometers left to ride, and I knew that uh, the other welds holding that seat up probably weren't going to be able to support. Uh, support me. So what I ended up doing as my temporary repair uh, was I went to a hardware store. Thankfully, I was close to a, a town that had a hardware store and I bought a C-clamp, which I used uh, to get me all the way back home. It didn't cause me any problems. It, it held all the way there. The only disadvantage was that, as you can see with the underseat steering, I was limited to how far I could turn the, the wheel left. So I uh, that was a, a little bit of a limitation, but I was... You know, of, CJ, people, you were, I, I know you mentioned on one of your videos how people are always a bit confused, the people you encounter when you're riding those bikes about the underseat steering. Like, I, I don't get that. How does that even even work, <laughs> which is an interesting concept uh, question as as it is. But I'm wondering what they say when they see a C clamp on there. Wondering how <laughs> what part that plays, you know, and why it was designed in there. That's funny. Yeah, I think it was pretty inconspicuous. I mean, when you see a recumbent, everything on it is foreign to you, so you probably wouldn't necessarily <laughs> look at that's, that unless it was parked right. There's and another geek on there. there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so a couple other highlights. This is riding through uh, just farmland. I just love riding through farmland. And this was a day that it rained for probably about 50% of the day. Uh, but look right here from this picture, it looks like it's about to start raining again. And uh, really interesting riding over these hills. Or, you know, it looks like you're, you know, with the sky just being pitch black like that. It was really, really scenic. Uh, and that night, that same night, that's, that black sky turned to a beautiful uh, sunset. On the final day with my uh, final day of that tour, I met up with my parents. There's a... a uh, uh, a town that, that, that I stopped for lunch in that's not too far away from where they live. So they came in, uh, came and rode with me, which was a, a lot of fun. Uh, they just you know, did a segment of my ride. I, I think I did more than a, a hundred kilometers that day. And they just did a, and they did a, you know, did about 12 of that with me. And then they looped back and went to their, their vehicle. So now I'll just maybe just talk about a little bit about sort of how I do my tours. Um, just a little bit about my gear first. Uh, so I use waterproof panniers. I bought these last summer. Um, they've been really great. They're very big panniers. Uh, as we we're talking about before, I mount my my cargo right at the very back on the on the luggage rack, and uh, these are very big capacity. They can they can fit about uh, 25 liters, um, and they're completely waterproof. They can get rained on. Uh, they're basically a dry sack that just happens to attach to a bike, and uh, yeah. I love them. They're, they're great. Uh, this is the tent that I use when I'm touring. This is actually my parents' tent from back in the 1980s, but it's been well taken care of and it, it works um, really well. Is there a question there? Yeah, just kind of a comment. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Paul Havens, seems like you are you have a lot of problems, but you have fun anyways. <laughs> I do, yeah. That. <laughs> well, I mean, after all, a tour is my vacation, right? I'm, I'm, I'm using my vacation days to go out and do it, and uh, I, 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 I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> See, I, I think that's exactly what she's saying is your, your great spirit. I think that's uh, it shows. CJ, go ahead. Yeah, so this is just an, an old tent. It's, it's very, very small. It's a two-person tent, but it, it fits one person in their gear uh, very well. And um, it's very light, about, I think, four pounds. So tents are probably, tech, tent, tent, tent technology has probably improved a bit since the 1980s, but this tent uh, was, 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 was good back then, and it's still good today. 
Uh, when I'm riding, I like to wear kind of an un unconventional uh, cycling gear. I like to wear these construction uh, construction shirts that are, are breathable and they have their bright colors and they have uh, fluorescent strips on them. And I want to be, because I'm spending most of my day on the road, I want to be as visible as possible. And these are, are quite comfortable for this. Uh, I also like that these have a front pocket, which means I can keep my camera in there, um, which allows me to be able to make the videos that we'll, we'll, we've talked about before. Uh, for my bottoms, I actually use, I used to wear, you know, cycling shorts that have a chamois in them, but of course I don't need the chamois when I'm sitting on my nice comfortable linear seat. Um, so I actually bought bathing suits that are spandex and uh, they seem to work just as well or even better in fact. And of course they double because when I get to my, you know, destination at the end of the day and I want to go for a swim, I don't have to carry a separate bathing suit. I can just use what I've been wearing that whole entire day. Uh, I don't carry any cooking gear with me when I'm camping. I, I like to eat at restaurants. I like to stop in little small towns and support local businesses. And I find that, you know, some small towns are, are very beautiful, but they're also so small that if you blink, you'll miss them. Um, but if you can, uh, you know, stop in a little small business, you get to, you know, get your, your, you spend half an hour there, you're eating a meal, you get to talk to some locals and you're putting some money into their, their local economy. And uh, I, I enjoy doing that. And it means I don't have to carry, you know, any kind of uh, cooking gear with me and not, not too many groceries either. I do occasionally end up in situations where I'm at a campground that's really far from small towns and I don't really want to ride, you know, 30 kilometers just to go and get dinner. I'd rather, you know, sort of relax in the evening instead. So I'll buy some food and occasionally I'll heat it up over my, my campfire. Another thing that I'd like to do for, for, for eating, I like to eat something called overnight oats, which is um, basically it's, it's uh, the idea of it is that you just simply add liquid to a mixture of dry ingredients and the next morning that's absorbs um, that moisture and it turns into a really nice edible consistency. Um, so I actually modified the, I actually eat overnight oats uh, on a regular basis at home, um, but I use milk to add. So I modified my recipe to include some skim milk powder in there, which means that all I have to do at my campsite is just add some water, which is something you always have ac to, access to when you're on a campsite. And then the next morning, you've got a really nice uh, meal of uh, over overnight oats. So I carry, I carried on my last trip, uh, eight, you know, uh, nine days worth of it. I ate the first day at home. So then eight, you know, the, eight, the next eight days I had uh, the dry ingredients to make this stuff and uh, it worked out really well. It was, uh, it's just really filling and really tasty. And some days I would wake up at, uh, you know, I'd eat my breakfast at, uh, you know, 7.30 in the morning and I would be fine to not eat any more until I got to lunch at, uh, you know, noon or one o'clock sometimes. Uh, I do a lot of uh, preparation before my tours, um, you know, planning out my route very carefully. I spend a lot of time on Google Maps. Um, Google Maps, if you if you ask it, it'll give you cycling directions, but I never really agree with the cycling directions that they recommend. I always want to validate it. I'll go in and I'll use Street View, and you can actually look at all the roads and see, you know, does this look like it's going to be a really, you know, quiet road or is this going to be a fairly busy road? And you're sort of balancing things out to, does it make sense to add a little bit of extra distance? Am I going to get a really nice quiet road? Or um, another great thing about Street View is you can make sure that you're not riding on gravel uh, because I mostly prefer to ride on, on uh, paved surfaces if I, if I can. Um, so I program those all after I've done it ahead of time into my, my Garmin GPS unit and I use that to navigate uh, throughout the day while I'm traveling. So that's pretty much covers my tours and what I do just to leave you with a, a few final thoughts. I think that I make these videos primarily um, just to inspire people. I really want people to try bike touring if they've never done it before. Uh, Cause it's a real, it's a lot of fun. Like, uh, you know, as the commenter said, like I get, I really enjoy my, my vacation. I really enjoy uh, being on these tours. And um, I think that a lot of people, when they think of bike tourism, they picture themselves getting on an airplane and flying to some other you know, foreign country and you know, going with a group or something like that. Um, but believe it or not, you don't, uh, you know, doing a, a tour is something that you can do in your own backyard or, you know, in your own surrounding area. Uh, just simply from these three tours that I've done in the last two years, I've seen so many places living in Ontario my entire life. I've seen so many places that I've never seen before and had so many great experiences that, that uh, I, I wish more people would, would try doing it. And um, so yeah, I guess my main advice is just, you know, think about local, think about doing things, you know, relatively local and also don't overcomplicate your gear. Just think about all you really need is, is some kind of a, a cargo rack on the back and some panniers. And if, if camping isn't something that you enjoy doing, uh, you can stay in motels, bread and breakfast, whatever you want to do. Um, it's a, a great experience and I, I highly recommend touring. Get out there and tour is the, is the message. 
Wonderful. CJ, thank you so much uh, for that. Let's, um, a couple of just little questions I had. Uh, you do such a great job on, as we've talked about with the videos and stuff. And I was personally curious and maybe some other folks, if they get out and tour or want to talk about what they do with their bikes maintenance wise and such uh, and make videos. Uh, I want to know a little bit about your equipment. So we saw the GoPro that you, that you mounted there. You said something about having your a camera handy. What do you use first of all to shoot? Yeah, so for like the narrated cycling videos, yeah, I used, it's actually a Yi, uh, uh, you know, uh, action camera, similar to a GoPro, and uh, that's mounted on the front of my bike. But when I'm touring, um, I don't I don't want to have to, you know, be turning that thing on and off, and I sometimes like to, you know, look at something that might be off the road. So what I use instead is uh, just a regular handheld digital camera. This is made by uh, Canon, and I have... My shirt has a front pocket right here. My camera spends the day right there. And when I see something that I want to show, I just, you know, with my right hand, I take it out. I turn the camera on. I record and I film like this as I'm riding. And then I turn it off and I put it away and it goes back in my pocket. And that's that's what I'm doing throughout the day. And then at the end of the tour, I've got probably about 400 clips or so, or maybe, no, sorry, maybe about 100 clips or so for each day, uh, maybe 200. It, it's, it varies from day to day, depending on how nice the scenery was. But I've got lots of clips to deal with when I get home. And then I spend a lot of time in front of the computer um, doing the post-production, getting those clips, you know, in a, in a sequence that's, you know, digestible. Uh, so it's, a, you know, relatively short. And I... Rather than putting music on top of my videos, I like to just talk and describe, you know, provide local history of, of things that uh, that I went past and, uh, you know, fun facts, things like that. And uh, just sort of, you know, just giving like a journal entry of, of what I did that day. It's in my video. very, very entertaining. Your style is incredibly entertaining. And uh, now I kind of... Uh, I, what what uh, editing program do you use? Let's get that out of the way quickly. You sit down. I know how long it takes. <laughs> uh, not everybody understands what it takes to edit video. What, what do you use? Uh, it's called Vegas Pro. I think I have 14. It's what I've been using forever. It's, it's what yeah. I know how to use. Yeah. Uh, really I think Sony came out with that originally maybe they a long time ago. I remember. Yeah. So, yeah, and I use uh, I use Premiere. Uh, so, but in any case, it, it's it's a lot of work and, uh, and you do a great job with the editing. Now, uh, we don't want to go too deeply into this, but I see all the musical instruments. I know you do some you do some music yourself so it's interesting to me that you don't really use any kind of music with your you didn't you don't produce your own music or anything so it's most important for you to get the message out and and to tell your story i'm guessing is that the point pretty much yeah i mean i have like things to say that i want to i want to share with the audience that i i, I you know i want to include i do have another youtube channel i don't really have any music videos on my cj hoyle channel but i have a cj hoyle music vi channel which has probably about 50 or 60 uh, multi-track recordings that i've done over the years and uh so I, I at some points i did have ideas that i wanted to um you know maybe make my own music sort of as background music um but uh i just figured you know i could put the same amount of effort into that that i spend um you know uh, uh, doing the voiceover that I decided the voiceover would probably be. Yeah. Uh, and I think your effect. emphasis is exactly right. And folks, uh, you know, you, you know, from just spending some time with CJ here now, what a great job he does of narrating. Honestly, your videos, I don't know how you do it, but extemporaneously, you just go off and, 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 and make a great narration for whatever you're doing. And you did it here today, even talking about the slides. So you have a great knack for that. So CJ, um, anything, any last words uh, before we let you go? No, I think that covers it. All right. Well, we really? thank you. We yeah, thank you so much for, for having spending. Me on. Yeah, we thank you so much for spending the time. I know uh, you, you put a lot of effort in, into this, and I know pretty much everything you do. So, thank you so much for coming on the Layback Bike Report. I hope we'll uh, we'll talk to you again. Thanks for having me. Okay, you bet. We'll see ya. All right, guys. CJ Hoyle. I think at this point we're gonna throw it over to Denny if we can get Denny up here. Uh, and we're going to have a sports report. Uh, Denny, I think you are, it looks like you're muted. You want to unmute yourself there? And uh, you'll be able to talk yeah, about right. the sports report. All right, take it away, Denny. All right, thank you. The Maryland Cycling Challenge was held May 18th. There are, were several recumbents challenging the race that starts and finishes in St. Mary's University campus in Emmitsburg, Maryland. There were two loops, a 37.1 mile loop and a 6.7 mile short loop. The 12 hour racers will do the long loop three times and switch to the short loop until time runs out. The six hour race was challenged by Jim Kolgenberger with 73.5 miles completed. And in the 12 hour race, Jeff Madden uh, completed 
214.4 miles, a distance that was third best in the 50 to 59 men's age group. He also won the 2019 World's Ultra Marathon Cycling Association Men's Recumbent 12 Hour Championship. Well done, Jeff. Um, now the National Senior Games were held in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, whoops. That, that's a phone call. I shouldn't have that. <laughs> I don't get any all day. And then, you know, during here we get it. Okay. The National Senior Games were held in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The road races were held in the community of Las Campinas. The course was an 8.8 mile loop featuring rolling hills and 370 feet of climbing. The road race was held early in the day, so it was relatively cool. But Santa Fe is over 6,500 feet in altitude, so it was a consideration. Uh, the 20 and 40K road races were held over two consecutive days. Age groups were started in four-minute intervals, so racers were starting within their own rage groups. Uh, or age groups instead of rage groups, although sometimes it can be a rage. Uh, in the 20K road race, men's 50 to 59 laid-back bike reports own Larry Seidemann finished 40th out of 44 finishers. In the men's 70 to 74 age group, Roger Reddish, 38th out of 50 finishers. In the 40K road race, men's uh, 50 to 59, Larry finished 36th out of 38 finishers. Men's 74, 70 to 74, Roger uh, Reddish did not finish due to mechanical issues. Uh, Larry also entered the sprint triathlon and finished a respectable 16th out of 32 participants, turning in a 24th fastest bike, bike leg in the 12-mile bike course. Boy, I'm getting tied up today. Hopefully, these guys will inspire more and recumbent cyclists to participate in local qualifiers for the senior games. Well done, Larry and Roger. Uh, a race reminder, next month in Washington, North Carolina, will be the Mid-Atlantic 100, 6, 12, and 24-hour endurance races. The race is on a 25.7-mile loop course in the low-traffic flatlands of coastal, coastal North Carolina. Washington is a quiet town with good... Hey! It, it, I guess it's not as quiet as you thought. I, not really. It, it, the dogs are out. The dogs are out. So uh, Washington is a quiet town with good food and great, great hospitality. I've been there many times. If you're thinking you might want to challenge an endurance race in the East, I highly recommend it. Finally, I'm going to make note of the upcoming World's HPV Championships to be held in Nandex, France next weekend. Recumbent bicycles, velomobiles, and fared vehicles will be converge on this French town for two days of high-speed bicycle racing. Last month, Larry Oslin was on the show giving us a preview of the upcoming event. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, that's it for this month. Uh, until next time, stay on the bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. Really good. We will do that, Denny. Thank you so much for that. And uh, let me just add real quickly, the uh, World Championships uh, are held in Europe every year. As many of you might remember, uh, Lars and I were there last year when it was in England. Had a great time. It's just a fantastic event. So uh, unfortunately, we can't make it uh, this year uh, to France. But if you are uh, if you are as lucky as Larry Oslin and can make that trip or anywhere in Europe watching us and you have the opportunity, get to the World Championships, either to watch or to participate if you can. They're, uh, they're a lot of fun. Great event. All right. At this point, I want to thank our sponsors one more time if we can, guys. TerraCycle, from fairings to headrest, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew, they have you covered. And Trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida near the Withlacoochee Trail, stop in to see Andrew and his crew. And Cruise Bike, their patented race and record-proven front-wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now, comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance, but fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And Lightning Cycles. Surprising speed, comfort, and agility, featuring the superior climbing quality that you've been looking for. Check out Lightning Recumbents today. All right, guys, let me uh, bring you up to date on some announcements uh, having to do with the laid-back bike report. 
we uh, talked about a little bit before. Uh, but I want to share with you uh, a, a, an upcoming trip. Um, my wife and I are going to be starting out by heading to Wisconsin, where we're going to shoot a, uh, a laid-back bike report at your L, at your local bike shop, at your LBS, uh, at the Hostel Shop. And as you guys know, we had Brianna, the new owner of the Hostel Shop, on briefly with Rolf making the announcement of the uh, of the sale. And we're going to stop uh, over there. It's going to be oh, another week or so. We're going to be heading that way. And uh, so we'll shoot the video, show you guys what goes on at the Hostel Shop and uh, bring that to you with a video. And from there, we're going to head to Iowa. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had uh, John Hodkin on, as you guys might remember. He's inner tuba, and uh, he totes the, the tuba trailer uh, on his trike all around uh, the UK, sharing his music and uh, experience with kids and uh, special needs folks. And he is going to bring that tour uh, to the U.S. for the very first time this summer. And he's going to do it in Iowa. So I think he's got about seven weeks worth of uh, touring around. Right in the middle of that is uh, a tour you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with called Ragbri, the, uh, uh, the tour across uh, Iowa that takes place every year with uh, 10 or 15,000 of your closest friends. I think there's always a really good uh, recumbent uh, turnout at this. Uh, so John is going to do that tour with his uh, with his trike and his tuba with the trailer and play along the way at various spots. And uh, Trey and my wife and I are going to be there to cover four or five days of the activities of John. And I also want to uh, uh, send an invitation to any other recumbent riders that are doing rag bri. Look for uh, look for us with our green hats on and. Uh, we will uh, we'll be out there shooting John, but we would love to you know maybe do a little interview with you and get some shots of you and your uh, bike or trike and uh, kind of make it a, a recumbent community affair. So uh, we hope to see a lot of uh, recumbent riders out there. And of course, uh, we're going to put a nice video together of uh, John's tour and put that up on the YouTube channel eventually too. So uh, that's going to be sponsored to some extent by uh, Connecticut Yankee Peddler. Um, our friend Dave Hendricks is uh, there in Iowa with his shop, and uh, uh, we're going to do another uh, LBR at your LBS uh, at the Connecticut Yankee Peddler to, to wind up our tour there. So uh, we look forward to our tour of Iowa and, uh, and, uh, and shooting lots of video to show you guys and share it with you. So uh, let's see here. What else have I got? Oh, you know, and one, uh, one thing I did want to ask. So if you are a recumbent rider and you're doing rag bri, I'm sure you're going to have a chance to meet John during the week. Uh, Trey and I are not going to be there for the end of the tour. So, you know, Friday, Saturday, I think Saturday or Sunday is when it ends. We would sure love to see some video and shots of John finishing, uh, that, uh, that ride. So if you can shoot some video of him, uh, even with your cell phones or whatever, uh, let us know. We would love to have that video to put in uh, the overall big uh, uh, inner tuba video that we're going to make. So help us out if you can. We'd appreciate that. All right, let's see. Video updates. So uh, also our very last LBR at your LBS video is when uh, we were in uh, New York visiting uh, Peter, uh, who's been on today uh, at uh, Alfred Station. And uh, we had a great time with Peter spending the day and shooting lots of video, getting his ideas and philosophy, looking at the shop, taking test rides. Uh, I think I think the video came out pretty well. It was a lot of fun. So uh, that's our latest on the YouTube channel. We'll have that link in the uh, description below as well. So check that out if you will. All right, a couple of uh, short uh, viewer submissions. You know, we're always asking you guys to send in pictures if you can of uh, uh, of the various things that you are excited about with your um, with your bent. So we got one from Bob Pelton. Can we pop that one up on the screen? Yeah. So Bob did uh, the ride across Ohio uh, that's called Goba, uh, and uh, he did it this month and sent this picture of his looks like lightning. They're right near uh, Lake Erie there, Putin Bay. So thanks. I uh, hope you had a good time, Bob. Thanks for sending that in. And our buddy Dave Scooter Panner calls this uh, shot 15 feet of kid hauling fun. So, yeah, that is about the longest arrangement you're going to see. But uh, apparently uh, Dave and his wife uh, ride that, uh, that tandem trike. I think that's a trident uh, chameleon, actually. And I know they have a ton of fun on that. So, David, thank you for sending that in. So if you've got pictures of your accomplishments or events, 
like these guys and you want to share them, please send them all to us at uh, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. All right, let's talk about what's coming up next month on Laid Back Bike Report. Uh, it's going to be a little bit later in the month than usual, August 18th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we've got a very uh, special guest, uh, Kevin Belanger is coming on, and he is representing Rails to Trails Conservancy. Uh, boy, I, I, almost all of us uh, riding out there take advantage of the wonderful rail trails. We talk about them all the time. And so we're going to have a nice chat with uh, uh, Kevin and talk about Rails to Trails. The most notable thing that's going on and the newsworthy thing that's going on with Rail Trails right now is the announcement a couple of weeks ago of the Great American Rail Trail, as you see here. And this is a, a comprehensive plan that they have put together to connect rail trails to go all the way across the country. A long-term plan, if you look at the uh, picture here, you'll see uh, the uh, filled in lines are the existing trails and the dotted lines are the trail gaps, uh, but still a pretty good start. There's hundreds, uh, probably even a thousand miles of trail, maybe more than that. We'll talk to Kevin about that, uh, as you can see there. And they are going to be putting those trails, uh, paving them and putting them together until they have a uh, trail that goes all the way across the country. So we're going to talk about that exciting development with Kevin. So uh, August 18th, 2 p.m. next month. Uh, Rails to Trails Conservancy. Join us for that. All right, you guys know I've talked about I talk about every show and during the show about uh, where you can find information about uh, the folks that have been on this show, how you can get a hold of them. So you're going to go to the description below the video, and when you look down there, you're going to see something like this. There's going to be first of all a clickable table of contents when the show's over. I get to work and uh, list all the different sub segments of the show and put them in a, uh, a table of contents like that, where you can just click on the number, the uh, the timing on the left you see there, and it'll take you right to that spot of the show. So you don't have to digest an entire two-hour laid-back bike report at once. You can go a little bit at a time, pick out the segments you like. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, uh, that's the way to do it. And all the links, all of our guests, and all the things we've talked about uh, the next section is the links, and we will have those there for you. Just click on them, and uh, you can go right to the websites uh, that you're interested in. Folks, I want to thank uh, Brian Ball. Uh, he was on with us earlier, and Bent Ryder for the promotional assistance that they give uh, the Laid Back Bike Report. Thank you, Brian. And all my wonderful panelists who have been with us today. Uh, Larry did a great job here picking up that directing job for the first time. Uh, thanks, uh, Larry. Great job. And as always, uh, Trey with the slides. And uh, actually, CJ even did his own slideshow today. So we appreciate that. You're an honorary panelist, I think, CJ. Need to make you one of those. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, certainly thanks uh, to all of you uh, for watching today. So if you would, help us out by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Click on that logo that you see below uh, on the lower right-hand side and uh, like our laid back uh, bike report facebook page and you can check out our website you see uh, you see the website right there on the uh, screen laidbackbikereport.com you can um, you can go right to that or that little i that i'm going to put up in the screen there you're going to see pop up right now uh, you can click on that and it will take you directly there when you get there you will be able to see uh, all the sponsors at the top of, of the page uh, we hope you'll support them our most recent show, our upcoming shows, the past shows, some bonus materials, and you can sign up for our mailing list, which I keep up to date. We'll send you uh, an email out uh, just maybe once a month, occasionally twice, giving you updates and telling you about uh, the show that's uh, going to be coming up. And while you're there, you can also hopefully buy a hat. Our good buddy Larry Varney is there uh, posing underneath the uh, the green chapeau. Buy one, it's 20 bucks plus uh, $5 shipping and handling, and that helps to finance some of the things that we do. So we uh, certainly appreciate that. So you can find it all at laidbackbikereport.com. So from all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, until our next webcast, so long, bent riders.